Hello, I'm Helene Oberman, Managing Director of Interior Design Magazine, and i like to welcome you. So we are here today to discuss Chersai, the global destination where one can learn about the latest product innovations and the hottest design trends from the world's leading manufacturers of surfaces and backing furnishings. The show takes place in the very lively city of Bologna, known for its magnificent buildings and its maze of medieval lanes weaving through century old porticos. So after a very long year on hiatus, both the show and the city are waiting to be rediscovered. And with that, I like to say, bentornato a Cersei e Bologna, welcome back. With me to provide insight into Cersei and some of the design trends you will be seeing both at the show and on the streets of Bologna are Christina Faedi, Manager of Promotional Activities for Ceramics of Italy, and Kristen Coleman, Senior Vice President of Novita Communications. Benvenute, welcome ladies. Grazie, grazie. <laughs> so first off, there may be some in our audience who are just not familiar with the show. So Christina, can you tell us what is Chersai? Well, Chersai is the most important international ex exhibition for ceramic tiles and bathroom furnishing. As you said, it takes place in Bologna and it comes every year. Unfortunately, we couldn't have, uh, uh, have the, the last edition in 2020, but we are ready for 2021. It's all on. Okay. So when and where will it be taking place? Obviously you said Bologna, but where in the city? Yeah, it will be now more or less two months. So we'll start on September 27th until October the 1st. It will be the 38th edition of the show. And uh, it's, uh, we can say it will be one of the most important show, international show that will happen after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So Italy and Bologna are back open and welcoming visitors again? Yes. Uh, the show we are we are proud to say in person, so uh, that this is a very important issue, and we uh, uh, we are almost uh, fully booked. Uh, we can say we are close to hundred percent as to the rates of um, to the figures of two thousand and nineteen. So this is a good result, and uh, the fifteen pavilions we have there are complete and we will have 600 exhibitors there. Um, we can say that half of those exhibitors come from abroad from 25 countries. And so we think that this is a great result and these figures could attract uh, many visitors. And uh, to do that, to, to help them to organize their trip, uh, we organize, we arrange a special section on our website and uh, the section is called Bologna Together. And this will uh, help the visitor, but also the exhibitor to organize their, their trip to, to Italy. So they can check information on flights, hotel, and taxi, trains, restaurants, and whatever. And also every safety disposition will be at hand for all those who want to, to visit Cersei and Bologna. Mm -hmm. So, Obviously, make it as easy as possible for someone yes. both to give it and to attend. Let's dive into some of the great specialties that both the city and the region are known for. The people that will come to Bologna will not only not only find in Cersaia, of course, tiles and sanitary wear and all the other sectors that are displayed there, but also a very welcoming city uh, from the food point of view, for example, because maybe not all of you know that Parmesan cheese and prosciutto and tortellini come from there, but uh, also the surroundings and the, the area around Bologna is very interesting. For example, Sassuolo, that is the, uh, the cradle of uh, ceramic tiles, Italian ceramic tiles, and uh, there, uh, supercars like Ferrari, Lamborghini, and uh, um, uh, Maserati are constructed, but also balsamic vinegar and thermal, thermal bath. And so it's a, it's a very, um, very interesting country to explore. And uh, 
why not? If there is time enough to have just a couple of days of rest there and enjoy um, the surroundings. It certainly sounds like a foodie's heaven. But Christina, you really took advantage of this last year and used the opportunity to re-envision the look and feel of the show, both from the exhibition layouts, really down to the branding. So let's start with the new logo for Tursai. What does the concept stand for? Yeah, uh, so the new logo is, uh, is a square, a cube that opens to new opportunities and uh, multiplies in different pixels to uh, explore new uh, vision of the, of the future. And in fact, the payoff says um, um, open to evolution. So just to uh, signify the desire to embrace new stimuli and develop them into fresh opportunities. So that's the graphic visual of our advertising. Okay, and of course, in terms of the exhibition center itself, for those who've attended the show previously, they will be pleasantly surprised to see the new and improved look of the exhibition center. So what will they find there? So the exhibition background, so in Bologna, just developed with three new uh, areas and new pavilions. Uh, so we will surely take advantage of this. And we have, especially uh, for all number 37, that is brand new, and allowed us to recreate and redesign the entire layout, especially focused on ceramic tile. In one of these halls, the contract hall, you have an exhibition called Archie Contract, which is devoted to 10 prestigious, I think all Italian architecture firms. So what will they be showing this year? Yeah, I mean, the, the concept of uh, the contract hall, which is brand new for, for this year edition, and Arcane Contract, that is the center of this hall, is uh, uh, the one that I mentioned before, so open to evolution. And in fact, you will find there these 10 uh, architectural firms that are especially uh, devoted to uh, contract. So they are famous, they are um, uh, international firms, and they're famous for their works with uh, real estate. Uh, around those uh, exhibit spaces, uh, there will be uh, other exhibitors of other section, section different from tiles and sanitary well, where that means uh, kitchens, interiors and exterior finishing, lighting technology, home automation, outdoor design and wellness. So definitely even more than just tile. Yes. Okay. But of course, Chersnai is not just about the, the latest product. You have the opportunity to attend also prestigious uh, lectures by leading architects, uh, uh, yeah, famous at international level. And I'm happy to announce that uh, this year, on October the 1st, we will have the Pritzker Prize Shigeru Ban with us and uh, delivering is a Lectio Magistralis. So uh, it's a prestigious name and we are very happy to have it with us for the second time actually, but in the first time it wasn't Prisco Prize. Yes, it became, uh, it was awarded in 2014. Well, and uh, I have to admit that Sigur Bon is actually an interior design hall of famer as well. Yeah, and many more um, conferences are in progress, but I'm not allowed to speak about that okay. now. <laughs> so I cannot reveal other names, so. Okay, well, everyone's just gonna have to be patient and hold out to closer to showtime, correct? True. Okay, so I know there's some out there in the audience that really like to get your hands sturdy and learn from the experts. And you also will have some live demos about tile installation. Yes, so we have the Tiling Town. It, it's uh, a unique opportunity to discover everything you need to know about tile installation and uh, uh, to do your job well and protect yourself from disputes. So it is organized by Cersai and Asoposa. It is the association of tilers and uh, it's especially dedicated to architects and tile layers and dealers. 
and there you can uh, uh, attend uh, technical uh, seminars, but also practical uh, tie-line demonstration. That is always very, very interesting and involving. Kristen, we don't want to leave you out of the conversation. So do you have any programs for the international design trade? And can you tell us a little bit more about that? We do. Um, so for years now, Tersai has organized a program called Tersai Business, um, where they invite specifiers from all over the world. Um, and for myself, working at, at Novita, I'm working with the ceramics industry for um, a long time. Uh, so we run the North American delegation. So we bring um, architects, designers, um, including the winners of our annual tile competition. So I highly recommend you, um, for those out there who have projects with Italian tile, definitely submit because you do get the chance to come. Um, but we also bring uh, journalists as well from the US and Canada. So it's, it's a really nice group. Um, we get CEU credits for it. Um, we spend five days or more in Bologna. Um, so going to the show, going to visit a tile factory, eating your weight in gelato. So there, there's a lot to do. Now, I know that my lovely dear colleague, Edie Cohen, we call her the tile maven because I know she's part of the delegation this year. Mm -hmm. so. She is. We, we, love, we love Edie. She, yeah. She's, um, she kind of helps. At this point, she helps us lead the trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as much as we all would love to be at the show um, live and in person and, of course, be enjoying that gelato, but what about for those who are unable to attend? Is there a virtual component? Well, we are very happy to hold our show in physical version, finally, but at the same time, Cersei is presenting Cersei Digital. Uh, it's a new digital platform to support the physical show where visitors can meet and do business in, uh, in a distance, so whether they want to make uh, the most of their time spent at Cersei or are, as you said, unable to attend the exhibition in person. And it's running three weeks, which means from September the 20th to October the 8th. So one week before the physical show and one week after. And the, the ticket office is now open on chersaya.it. So we encourage everyone to uh, register there because uh, the ticket will be uh, the same for coming physically in Bologna or to enter the digital section of Cersaia Digital. And uh, there you will have two main uh, opportunities. The first one is to see the, uh, to have a preview and to see you even during the show, all the new products that will be launched at the show, but also to create uh, an additional uh, network place where to meet the exhibitors. So uh, we think it's a good opportunity to support the physical show in this very, still very difficult period we are all living. Okay, so with all this talk about your side, one may be asking, why time? That's such a great question, Helene. Um, so, I mean, as you know, designers have used ceramic tile for centuries, right? Because it's beautiful, but it's also a workhorse. So now with advances in technology, and as we've seen over the past year, a really, you know, a global concern for, you know, public safety, hygiene, um, indoor air quality, um, I think it's become even more relevant today. So like from a material standpoint, ceramic tile is made from natural materials. It's, you know, mainly sand and clay and other uh, natural materials for, for porcelain. Um, but it's fired at high temperatures to create, you know, a non-porous, hard-wearing, durable material. Um, it doesn't retain dirt. It's naturally inhospitable to bacteria and mold. Um, because it's inert, it doesn't burn. Um, which also means that in the case of fire, it won't release toxic substances into the air, which can be a problem with other materials. So yeah, so I think for all of those reasons, that's why ceramic tile is, is fantastic because it, it addresses the need for eco-friendly products, but also delivers standout quality and style without affecting occupant health. Okay, well, let's think about the idea of style, right? Let's just 
top trends and yep. what one will be seeing at the show this year. So we all know things are getting better and things actually are getting bigger. So at the show this year, it looks like tiles are actually going to the extreme and that's the size that is. Yeah, you're, you're certainly right. Um, so, I mean, uh, Italian manufacturers were one of the first ones to develop these extra, extra large porcelain tiles, um, but they continue to evolve each year. Um, so right now they come in sizes up to about five and a quarter by 10 and a half feet. Um, and thicknesses range from three to 20 millimeters. Um, so it's, it's just exciting to see how it evolves every year. Um, you know, there are thousands of designs to choose from. So, you know, more minimal tiles can, or more minimal designs can turn the tile into an architectural covering and really highlight um, architectural geometries. But then there are tons of colors and bold patterns. And with a large surface, it acts kind of like ceramic wallpaper. Mm -hmm. um, but either, either way, the large format of the tiles um, minimize grout lines. Um, so th they create a totally seamless surface. And we're finally starting to see it pop up in projects all over the world. And actually, the extra, extra large sides are really versatile, too, because it can be used in a lot of different ways. I know you kind of touched on it. But indoor, outdoor, kitchen, bath, walls, floors, facades, correct? Totally. So, I mean, with the extra large tiles, yeah, they, they present a ton of possibilities for architecture, but also interiors. Um, I mean, in terms of, you know, exteriors, like because, because the, the thin large slabs are super lightweight, um, you can use them for things like exterior facades and, and rain screens um, and to help regulate the, the temperature of buildings and um, energy savings and, and things like that. Um, but we're also seeing some really exciting developments in kitchen and bath too, um, because in the, in the beginning, these tiles were only came in a, in a super slim kind of profile. Um, and now they're available in 12 and 20 millimeters, which means you can they can be installed in one piece, just like a slab of, of marble or stone. You can use them for um, for countertops, for kitchen islands. Um, and there's an, another new development, which is the introduction of marble look slabs with a through body vein. So um, like the companies use a controlled sedimentation process um, so that the veins are consistent throughout the body of the tile. Um, and yeah, it's especially great for, for countertops because the edges and the corners are vis visually consistent with the surface. A lot of companies are making turnkey solutions too. So, you know, pedestals, shower trays, shelving. Um, so you can literally tile every surface now if you wanted to. It's a one-stop shop just to get some tile. So, well, from opposite ends of the spectrum. So, you know, there's the extra large format but then we're also seeing a slimmed down version. So how do these sort of more slimmer tiles compare to those subway tiles that we actually are all so fond of? Yeah, so it's it's kind of going extreme in, in both directions. So while you have these giant porcelain slabs, um, one of the micro trends that we've been seeing recently is the emergence of these super skinny tiles. Um, I mean, subway tiles are, are super classic. Um, they usually have like a, a, a one to two dimensional ratio, um, but these are, are super long and slim and they range anywhere from like two by eight inches to three inches by 16 inches. Um, and they come in all types of colors and finishes. Um, there's tons of matte options, kind of glass-like. Um, neutral and bold colors. So they, they really offer an endless, um, endless possibilities in terms of installation. Um, and some of them even have really funky, uh, like colorful pencil tiles. So you can create really interesting contrasts. So I know that we've all spoken about the sort of health the importance of health and well-being of an individual in a lot of conversations over the last year and how really the access of nature can improve upon one's mental and emotional state. So with that in mind, really, how do you see biophilia being incorporated into some of this year's tile designs? 
So, I mean, as you know, biophilia is such a huge component of, of design these days. I mean, I think back to um, like the glass biospheres, you know, um, in Seattle for, for Amazon um, that they designed, but there's also other ways that you can incorporate biophilia in, in more subtle ways. Um, and for tile, um, believe it or not, like materials, even mimicking nature can help improve like a, a person's mood and perception of space. So um, Italian manufacturers offer all kinds of nature inspired designs. On one hand, there's a lot of cool patterns and like palms, leaves, florals, botanical motifs. Um, sometimes they're realistic, realistic looking, other times they're more abstract. Um, but there's also a lot of natural material effects. Um, so if you, you know, incorporate a wood look plank tile, um, you know, a marble slab, um, and they're becoming more realistic looking every year, especially with advances in digital printing and also 3D glazing. Mm -hmm. Well, one trend I think everybody loves is terrazzo, and it's really stood the test of time, and nobody seems to do it better than the Italians you know, terrazzo has really deep roots in, in Italian culture. I mean, you see it everywhere, just walking down the street in, in Bologna or Venice. Um, um, in the tile industry, it, um, I would say it emerged as a trend between five to seven years ago, especially when uh, postmodernism was making a huge comeback um, in interiors and, and furniture. Um, but it's definitely stuck around because it's, it's really dynamic, right? It can work in nearly any setting, um, depending on the, the color and the scale of the, the flex, you know, it could be subtle, bold, neutral, dramatic. Um, and some manufacturers, because the tiles are digitally printed, they're even playing with, um, terrazzo and using it as a template to incorporate different materials into one design, which I think is really interesting. Hmm. Well, you know, I don't think terrazzo is going anywhere and it's great to see sort of like how it's sort of becoming a, just a very modern pattern, um, even having but very historical roots. But let's face it, like we've had such a crazy last year and I think we all really just want to make our lives like that much easier. And thankfully, all the tile manufacturers are really thinking about the ease of installation. And that's a trend you'll be seeing were correct, like both for indoors and out. Totally. Yeah. I mean, looking at, so I mean, I've, I've spent the past year looking at, you know, new products coming out of Italy and one, um, one development which has been really exciting has been the emergence of these easy installation systems um and you're right everyone <laughs> wants to make their lives a little bit easier and especially you know with the remodeling market and people retrofitting their offices and you know sometimes there is a, a short supply of, of available contractors right so there are some systems that designers can use um, and install themselves so um, and I use the term install lightly, but, um, but there's um, floating floor systems um, that come with a, a soundproofing mat. So you can just um, roll down the soundproofing mat, put the tiles right over, and then it comes with a special filler. Um, so there's no need for, for grout or, you know, a professional installation of the floors. And the nice thing is, you know, in a couple of years, if you wanted to change it, um, you could easily switch out the tile um, or switch out the floor completely. Um, and that's something we're actually considering doing with our own office um, since we're adding a little expansion to it. Um, there's also dry interlocking systems um, that can help create smart floors. Um, and it's watertight, so you can put so sensors, electric wiring, um, control modules, you, they can all be placed underneath the tile surface to regulate things like temperature and lighting, um, which also helps to reduce energy consumption as well. Um, so those are some of the systems on the interiors. Um, and then for exteriors, um, there's a growing collection of porcelain pavers. Um, so they come in two centimeter or three centimeter 
thicknesses. And the nice part is well, there's a lot of nice parts, but um, they can be dry laid um, onto grass, gravel, or sand. So you can create an instant outdoor living room. Um, I actually did this at my house this summer, um, which was pretty easy to do. Um, and it also helped raise the value of our house. So that was kind of a, an, a nice bonus. Well, Kristen, I really appreciate you really giving us sort of a deep dive into some of the trends. And Christina, I really appreciate your time and insight into Tersai and really what everyone should be expecting at the show this year. So, you know, mille grazie. And for our lovely audience out there, please make sure to check out the Tersai website to learn more about attendance. And I hope to see you all in Bologna this fall. Ciao. Ciao, Helene. Ciao. See you there. Hi, welcome to Metropolis Sustainable Product Spotlight. I'm senior editor, Kelly Beeman. And in this episode, we're taking a look at an upholstery developed for furniture manufacturer by Loom Textiles, which is known for its crafts-driven approach to design. Not only is the new line of fabric rare earth, BIFMA tested for contract use, it is also something rather revolutionary, a biodegradable polymer that is also low VOC and bleach cleanable. Here to tell us more about this new collection are Andrea Babb, Loom's Director of Product Development Management, and designer Suzanne Tick, the company's creative director, whose namesake studio drives their products, sustainability, wellness, and very well-known high performance. It's so interesting to hear that it's possible to have something that doesn't fill up landfills and also has these great high performance qualities. Um, Bloom, it seems, is a pioneer. And this is not the first textile that you've developed that is biodegradable. Is that right? No, it's our second. It's our second this year. It's the, the first two that are in the industry, which is really exciting for us. That, that is exciting. And this one specifically is recycled, use recy uses recycled content. Um, post-consumer recycled content, and that is post-consumer polyester, which I think is very important to explain. If you don't mind, just walk us through the innovation, especially hitting this new milestone so quickly after the first, um, to explain what went into developing Rare Earth. You know, we started three, three, four years ago in exploring biodegradable fibers and uh, started talking to our manufacturers and suppliers and really, really wanted to focus in on how we wanted the fibers to look and feel. Um, it's not only, you know, we know it's polyester, but how can we make um, the polyester look more matte and more natural, and more, you know, fiber that you really want to touch and feel. And because, you know, it can go in a lot of different directions. So, we started talking to them early on on the delustering effects and and how to how to spin it and um so we've we worked with our supplier a long time ago and we get the yarn in in the white form and we start weaving structures we we usually start from fiber um and from those structures we try a number of different um weave structures and then have the manufacturer use that yarn and we're usually the first off the rack with the fibers and um and then we start looking at dye stuff and seeing how it dyes and see how it finishes and things like that so this is that, a strong point for you guys i mean this is what you're known for the fact that you are that the design begins so at such a, a, an early stage developing your own fiber yeah you know Kelly, this is the reason that Loom really exists, is that, um, you know, I looked at the industry and I thought there's not a, a textile company whose ethos is based on sustainability. And 
I, you know, as a kid, I grew up on a junk metal, you know, scrap metal yard with my dad. Everything's recycled. So I did, I just figured everybody did that. And I realized in working in the industry that, you know, it, it was all about more and more and more to grow your business, more products, more products, more products. And I always felt so uncomfortable with that because it's so, you know, too much product in the industry. So when, um, when, you know, when I conceived of this idea and started talking to, to some companies about it um, and said, this, you know, we could really make this whole basis of this collection be about sustainable materials. Um, that was the, the, the original seed to um, what Loom has become, so. Mm -hmm. And as you just mentioned, you you certainly you have worked with other companies and you do consulting. So what is it about the partnership with Technion that made this possible? Because it sounds like you really needed a, a good partner who was on the same um, page, so to speak, with the sustainability. I think what I mean, we have a great team. I mean, Andrea and Dave and, and it's a tight group. It's not a huge group. And um, frankly, David Felberg lets us do what we want to do. As long as we can be profitable and we can show that we can launch these products and they're uh, relative for what's what's needed for the time, they apply beautifully. I mean, it was it's really been a, a really an amazing experience to be able to do that. I mean, Andrea, you may want to speak to that too. I mean, the, what's the magic behind it mm -hmm. is that, you know... Yeah, yeah. Especially making it contract grade. I mean, oh, something that wrong. has this strength, you know, that feels safe. But I mean, that's the, I think the, the, the big exciting moment here. So I'd love to hear that, Andrea. Like, how is that possible? That it's bleach cleanable and biodegradable. It's amazing how far technology in terms of fiber, fiber de development has come, you know, even in, in the past couple of years, the you know, it was on, we were always able to access recycled yarns or partial recycled content in our development. But, you know, this biodegradable fiber is a tremendous step forward. It's, you know, this development of, or invention, I should say, of the biocatalyst additive, you know, that is part, you know, goes into the, the polymer chip, you know, that the polyester um, is extruded from. Is, is groundbreaking because this will actually allow the, the polyester to, to break down in a very specific environment. And when you think of, you know, the amount of waste that goes into a landfill every year, you know, this is groundbreaking. I, we truly think that all polyester is, if it's not 100% recycled, it's going to be biodegradable or even better biodegradable and recycled in just a couple of years time you know I always think about you know how big cell phones used to be <laughs> you know they were they would be as big as a, sh a shoebox you know years and years ago you know and then you know technology is is so for those things is so small now you know mm -hmm. that's what happens in any industry you know we'll see polyester that can't break down is going to be unheard of in, in a couple of years time and, and we love that yeah you know, less is, yeah. you know, less is, we do more with less all the time. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, Suzanne, you were gonna add to that. No, I, I think it's important to know that I think standards are gonna, you know, the Association for Contract Textiles kind of made this profile of what you have to pass and all of that. And then lead is, is you know, extremely important in terms of points. So now we really think that, um, you know, projects are going to be asking for all biodegradable materials or 100% recycled. Um, and we're starting to see that and we're starting to be asked for that. And so we are, you know, well equipped with our collection and, because we don't come out with a lot of products. And so what we do come out with is a really important, you know, focused um, collection that passes all of those uh, parameters so that, um, again, it's, it's not about more product in the, in the pipeline, it's about the right products in the pipeline that pass all of these uh, codes and tests that are truly sustainable. Absolutely. Can yeah. you, are you able to say um, which furnishings uh, it's available on or can it be specified across offerings? It can be 
our rare earth collection and all of our textiles can be specified with any manufacturer. We do very stringent application testing, you know, whenever we uh, go in, go further into the development with anything. So the, the great thing is we're able to fully test on all of the Technion pieces and also Studio TK's pieces. So that gives us an overall view of, of how well it's going to do on any type of seeding or vertical application, you know, whether that is task seeding, you know, where it's a 24 or seven type environment, or if it's, you know, your beautiful lounge pieces, you know, that you'll have in the, in the public spaces of your, or of your design. We don't launch it if it, if it doesn't work great. Yeah, or, you know, Andrea's really got the claims thing on her mind too. And so we know if, if Andrea is kind of like, uh, uh, we can just see her kind of <laughs> screaming a little bit and we're pushing back hard saying, Andrea, they just aren't upholstering it properly. <laughs> you know, and, we get into, and then, but we really, we look at all of the images of everything that we're working on, on all these different seating types to make sure. And at the end of the day, we do the right thing because you know, you can't slide something in and fake it because if it gets upholstered and we know something, you know, could fail, you know, right. it, it's not even worth it, you know? So yeah. it's, you know, we're really, you know, we're all in it all the time yeah. together. So I love great. that combination though, Suzanne. I love the fact that you don't hold back in terms of uh, the commitment to craftsmanship, right? It, and so it sounds like, in our conversations that that it ends up limiting the amount of products you bring to market, but they are of a certain level. I mean, craftsmanship is often associated with the slow, small batch production, but uh, you know, this focus is, is really, it sounds so earth friendly. You know, I love the fact that that's, that is really the, uh, the hallmark, right? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we range from, you know, products in the 200s with renewable resources and we go all the way down to the 20s and you know though we consider our collection a boutique collection because we start everything from scratch and we design everything you know it's all you know built um, sequentially we know exactly how long everything's going to take and you know, working together with Andrea and her team and, and, you know, our marketing and getting it all out. It's mm -hmm. all, everything, there's no kind of, we all, it all has to be at the same level mm -hmm. and the upholsterability of it does too. And, you know, you know, the engineering is um, critical. So we have to engineer the, the products properly. And most of those products that are our top sellers, you know, have been manifested, almost all of them on our looms in the studio. I want to make sure, Andrea, that I didn't miss some of those certifications. We've really focused on the ones that we think are really important and really help our customers and our designers understand, you know, what they're purchasing from us. So our main certification is Declare certification. And the wonderful thing about Declare is it has two very important components to it. The first part of it is assessing the ingredients transparency of all of the components that go into a particular fabric. So that is the, that could be yarns, that could be dye stuffs, uh, that could be finishes. And what we want to see is that we have full ingredients transparency and we also want to understand that there's no chemicals of concern in the fabric and when a fabric is certified red list free that means that you know it has been vetted we have the full transparency of it and we know that there are no chemicals of concern in there we also do what is called a clean air certification and that's also a standard that you have to have before you can have declare labeling for your fabrics. And that means that, you know, your, you don't have volatile organic compounds, you know, off-gassing from your fabrics. You know, you don't want to have formaldehyde and other compounds like that, you know, off-gassing into your space. So the combination of red list free and clean air certification means that you can be very comfortable specifying those fabrics. And we have declared certification for over half of our fabrics. Um, and that's something that's really easy to find on our website. Andrea, would you mind walking us through the various styles 
uh, that are a part of the collection and which certifications those styles have. Absolutely. Um, for our rare earth collection, we're really happy to be able to say that we have environmental certifications for each one of our styles that are included in that, that collection. So um, mitered, of course, um, you'll have seen that beautiful product shot, you know, of the the bright colors, you know, uh, Suzanne's inspiration behind that one. Um, Mitered is made in the USA and it has recycled content in it uh, and renewable content in it. Uh, of course, there's wool content, uh, there's cotton in it. Um, and it really, you know, re we're finding that renewable content, you know, is just as important as recyclable content. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, can be renewed, you know, and not at the detriment of the environment. And the wool is from Pennsylvania, so it's great. So it's so we're trying to stay close to home with a lot of these, you know? We seem to be entering a new era when interior products aren't just required to be sustainably made, but also biodegradable. The fact that a big part of Loom's business comes from selling directly to consumers also suggests the impact of these new products may be felt far and wide. Thank you for joining us for Metropolis Sustainable Product Spotlight with Loom.